welcome to the 2020 Brain and Transcranial Photobiomodulation Virtual Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Joe DeVero, and uh, my guest now is uh, Dr. Sanjay Manchada. He is a, phys a psychotherapist and meditation teacher for over 25 years. Uh, he left his job as a computer science professor in response to an inner calling. Following a major awakening, he trained in various sp spiritual and mystical traditions, particularly different forms of Buddhism and Hinduism, as well as various forms of body and mind therapeutic work. Uh, his teachings are confluence of the wisdom streams of Eastern and Western knowledge, and uh, he's practiced as a licensed physical therapist, a psychotherapist te and teacher in Tucson until last year when he relocated to San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we're privileged to have him here because he's one of the first people to investigate holistic energy therapies as relates to consciousness research. And I want to thank you for showing up today, being here with us and explaining this to us. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Joe. Well, you know, when I'm interviewing people here and uh, we need to talk just for a second on how did you get your story? You know, how did you get here? And I know we're going to cover that uh, to do photobiomodulation research and the steps that you did, and then maybe like what prompted your research question? So I'm very fascinated in, to get into this with you. So go ahead, Andre, tell me sure. about it. Sure, you know, I grew up in India and I was very interested in the deeper questions of suffering and of life. And, uh, and I had a very Western education, so I really got interested in science very early on. <laughs> And I thought science would provide me the answers. And I very naturally followed that thread uh, to the US to study further. And I did my bachelor's in electrical engineering in, uh, at an IIT in Delhi in India. And then I did a PhD in computer science and uh, Stony Brook, New York. And I became a professor of computer science. And then I realized that Somehow I'd sort of gotten a little sidetracked on the deeper questions. <laughs> and what was particularly relevant was that I had to deal with my own suffering. It seemed to be increasing. I had a lot of anxiety when I was young and then became depressed. And so I really started to look within. And that actually brought me back, you know, 180 degrees turn to looking at Eastern mysticism and inner practices. And I started to do yoga and meditate. And, uh, and that led me deeper. And eventually, I decided to quit my job as a professor and, and really just leave for a while, seasoning. And soon after that, also, I realized I had a talent for working with people and a desire to work with people. So I made a very big turn from being very left brain to really moving to the body and the right brain, you might say, and studying therapy and movement therapy and energy healing, and all kinds of uh, different modalities that involve the body and levels, different levels of energy. And a lot of it was an attempt to balance myself and heal myself, and then in the process to serve other people through what seemed to help me. So that's sort of been the journey. And so I ended up becoming a meditation teacher and a psychotherapist. And in the beginning, I actually even avoided uh, equipment and computers for many years. <laughs> and, and then eventually, when, I, when my left brain came back online, it's sort of the two sides of my life coming together. And that's when that's happened when I, you know, a client of mine introduced me to some meditations that were similar to what I was teaching, but they were taught by a biofeedback practitioner, Les Femi, one of the fathers of biofeedback. And I was impressed with the, with the effect that they had. And I studied with him and started to learn biofeedback and neurofeedback include that in my practice and even notice that how I could help meditation students with the principles understanding the principles of EEG and how the different waves correspond to different states of attention. Nice. So for example, you know, a lot of students in meditation suffer from uh, thinking mind. They're, they're, they're too dull. 
and they're losing focus. And this very much corresponds to having too many slow waves in EEG. And then there's training to help you to focus, which is used for ADD and ADHD kids. And also can help meditators who are having that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what led me also into the area of uh, brain and body stimulation with uh, DC and AC current. And I worked, looked at uh, DC stimulation to heal depression. And I was depressed for 15 years. And that's one of the things that really helped me is I did DC stimulation on my own brain for depression. I even experimented with the body well before the papers came out, you know, dealing with some chronic fatigue kind of symptoms and looking at how to push the energy system. The energy system. Yeah, because it all, I mean, the yoga was sort of the body work and then the brain work and you kind of put it together. So yeah. maybe this is a good time to pop in and look at the slides. Hmm? Absolutely. Yeah, so since then, basically, that's what's been happening is that I've been working on both areas. I teach meditation, and I've been doing more and more research on different uh, consciousness technology. I've been part of the Transformative Technology Lab, which is function is to evaluate and promote uh, transformative technology to help people to shift into greater wellness and, and uh, health and depth of who they are. Yes, sir. Can you share your screen? Then? Yeah, because that's where I <clears throat> first was introduced to you at the trans transformational <laughs> technologies. And that's kind of a big, a big deal. So uh, please, please. let's go to the, yeah, go to the first, there we go. Achieving higher states of consciousness with transcranial photobiomodulation. Photobiomodulation in the, in the context of low energy therapies. I'm excited. All right. Yeah, so that's the subtopic is I'm going to uh, first start with the context of low energy therapies and show the similarities and differences with uh, photobiomodulation as I think of it as one of the low energy therapies. So what the idea behind low energy therapies is that we want to input into the body and the brain a small amount of energy, light or other forms of electrical or electromagnetic energy. And when we do that, we get a change of state. The body changes state, the brain changes state. And what we find is that if we repeat that change of state in the right way, the right frequency, then uh, that repetition can lead to a more of a permanent access to this new state. If it's desirable, then it becomes a desirable trait. And that's what we want to achieve. And what do we mean by low level energy? So here's some examples. So on the top right, we have uh, um, magnetic, so electromagnets, so we could input magnetic energy at different frequencies. At the right bottom, we have uh, an AC current machine. And then in the middle, we, we could even use something like ultrasound, although I won't be talking about that, but my group is one of the earliest groups really examining transcranial ultrasound for changing state and for meditation. And then we can also use DC current instead of AC current. And then we have uh, photobiomodulation. We have a headset of infrared light stimulation of the brain. And in the middle, we have a consumer level device that inputs visible flashing light. So just flashing light in the eyes as an example. So coming back to the idea of state change versus trait change. So when you input, a, when, you, when you do a, any kind of intervention, whether it involves inputting light into the head, doing yoga and meditation, or taking a pill, you, the purpose is to change your state into a beneficial or a positive direction. And so the graph below shows that you can have a large state change from the intervention and a small amount of learning that teaches you to get into that state easily. Or you can have a large state change, but a negative amount of learning. And that's what happens when you have chemical dependency. You take a pill, you feel better, there's a nice state change, and, but you don't learn to get there without the pill. That's chemical dependency. That's negative learning. So what we're finding is that in these low-level energy therapies, we don't get negative learning. 
we actually get a large amount of positive learning. So in fact, a lot of the devices that I've used with people therapeutically, they become independent of them. They don't need them anymore after some months. That's my experience. Not always, but often. So I'm going to start by talking about a low level energy therapy, which is the simplest form of applying energy to the system. That's transcranial direct current stimulation or TDCS. So it basically it involves attaching a battery to the head in a controlled fashion. So the controlled fashion is that we have a constant current in a very low amount of current going through the brain so we don't cause any damage. Currents are well below, typically below two milliampere. So you can use up to two milliampere. Um, and so where you put the positive electrode is the anode, and where you put the negative electrode is the cathode, and current flows from positive to negative. So here's an example of current flowing in the head. The red line uh, shows how the current is spreading through the head when you put two electrodes at certain locations on the head. And here's an example of a couple of machines I rigged together in the 90s, even well before the earlier papers started coming out. And just to play, it was just really working with my own symptoms of depression and chronic fatigue. And but I waited to do this on clients until more research came out. So one question you can ask is, is TBCS safe? And it turns out it's extremely safe. Here's a recent paper from 2016 by all, most of the major authors and researchers in the field that explain how there's uh, almost no evidence of any, <clears throat> any really medical side effects. In, at most, you may have a side effect of some sort of skin rash and below the electrodes, and a couple of other possibilities which are not relevant for us. So here's an interesting uh, paper by Chang on uh, the effect of electric currents on ATP generation in rat skin. So we know that when we apply transcranial or, or when we apply infrared light to the body, we get many positive effects. We get an increase in ATP, for example, and so on. We find that it's, it's the same with all the energy modalities. That's what I want to point out here. So when you, want to, when you apply DC current to skin, you very low current in this case, up to 0.5 milliamps, you get increased ATP production by up to 500%. You get increased protein synthesis, increased amino acid transport, and increased cell signaling in general. And the effect increases as you increase the current from 10 to 500 microamperes, and then starts to drop off. So, you know, there's like a, 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 a U curve in terms of the beneficial, or a bell curve, depending on how you view it, in terms of the beneficial effects. And it's very similar to when you apply other forms of energy, whether it's electromagnetic energy, or, if, for example, therapeutic infrared light. So, um, so that's something, that's why you also call it low level energy therapies, because the amount of energy being put in is low. So some of the benefits that come from uh, DC current stimulation are accelerated learning. So when you combine a DC current stimulation of parts of the brain that are involved in a certain task. So let's say there's a certain task, you figure out the part of the brain that's involved in it, and then you stimulate it with a positive electrode, then that part of the brain gets amped up and it learns better. So the speed of learning increases and the amount of learning increases. So you typically stack DC with some other interventions. So here's an example of some research done at the University of New Mexico. They did a, they were funded by DARPA, so they did a threat detection task. So if you're looking at, looking from a drone and you're looking at a scene, a picture that the drone is transmitting, then you want to detect threats, say hidden, uh, you know, hidden snipers, for example. So in this case, they did it in the form of a video game called Star Wars. And they showed that if you simultaneously stimulate the brain in certain locations, especially on the right temple, while learning this task from scratch, the learning is faster and the results are better. 
So here's an example of a device you can buy right now. It's a consumer device from Halo Neuroscience. And it looks like a headphones with, uh, you can see these uh, comb electrodes on the right that stimulate the motor cortex. And as, so they stimulate the motor cortex with some DC current while you're learning some mechanical task like uh, uh, playing, the, playing the violin or engaging in some athletic exercise. And they show that it improves your ability to acquire muscle memory. Muscle memory. I saw them been using that at the Olympic Committee there. Uh, the Olympic yeah. Committee there. They had it on TV. I thought that's got to be good. Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting that we some of these principles also apply to photobiomodulation. That's really something that things that we can think about in the field of photobiomodulation. This generalizes, and how much is a question of further research, really, and exploration. So TDCS uh, is particularly effective for depression. There's a lot of studies that show that TDCS can have positive effects on depression. And uh, there's a huge meta-analysis that shows positive results. And when you individualize it to clients, like you can do in a private practice like mine, because I typically do brain imaging with uh, EEG and I can see what the person's, my client's brain is doing, and then tell them, to use certain placements of these electrodes at home under my supervision, I get really great results. And we combine them with therapy as well. So I have used this for over 15 years very successfully in my practice. And you can buy a cheap home device, TDCS device for 150 bucks. So it's very affordable. Like it. So a friend of mine, Bashar Bhargan, also came up with a particular placement on the brain of TDCS for meditation. And that's being explored further as well. So that was TDCS. Now let's just talk about TACS, which is applying alternating current to the brain. And as we know, the alternating current, the current is going back and forth between the electrodes that are placed on the head. And it can also have different waveforms. It could be sinusoidal, square, sawtooth, etc. What that does is to suddenly open up an almost infinite parameter space. In other words, we, the question becomes, what frequency do you apply to the brain? Where? Why? And what is the shape of the waveform? Now, we, is it 100 hertz, 10 hertz, 1 hertz? Does it look like a sawtooth, a sinusoid? And there's so many possibilities. This is a really an open area of research. This has not been well researched. So I started looking into this some years ago, and I also brought to bear my knowledge of biofeedback and EEG neurofeedback. So we already know that the brain produces uh, waves. It's an electrochemical organ that produces waves in a certain range that is understood, and there are certain bands that we've uh, defined for brain waves, like delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma and all the way from 0 0.5 hertz to 140 hertz and actually even higher. And so the question is, what happens if you, if you apply current to the brain? And then we find that if you apply current at a certain frequency to the brain, let's say you apply current at 10 hertz to the brain. Turns out that if you apply 10 hertz current to the brain, especially if it's a sinusoidal waveform, you can increase the power of 10 hertz. So example, if you apply alpha current to the brain, you can increase the alpha power in the brain. So we call that frequency or brain entrainment. And then that has certain subjective effects. So in general, if you increase the frequency of stimulation of the brain, then you can, the energy goes up. So you can actually, up to a certain point, you can increase the frequency of stimulation and you feel more energized. Body awareness goes down. Arousal goes up. So you're increasing the frequency of stimulation, energy goes up, body awareness drops, you get more mental, you could say, or more outside the body, your arousal goes up. Your focus goes external, you get more externally focused. And you could say the reverse. If you reverse it, if you if you decrease the frequency of stimulation, that stimulate the brain at a low frequency. Your focus goes internal. 
you get more aware of the body, your energy level drops, you get quieter. So here's a, a table that sort of describes this, this kind of effect of stimulating the brain at various frequencies. So the focus, uh, when you're at uh, one to 12 hertz, it's low frequency, 12 to 15 is in the middle, and 15 to 100 is high. So we can see that the focus uh, is internal, balanced or external, the energy is low, medium, and high, body awareness is high, medium, and low, state is relaxed, alert, activated, and emotions also change, baseful and sad, or sad at the low end, neutral or present in the middle, and joyful or agitated at the high end. So this is something that we actually know about from doing uh, biofeedback. But it also works when you apply small amounts of AC current to the brain. You can also use ultra low frequency stimulation that's lower than one cycle a second, and you get a parasympathetic response. You get this, this deep shift in the autonomic nervous system that has very powerful results. And, uh, and particularly, I got particularly interested in high frequencies in the brain. High frequencies in the brain have only been studied recently. Traditionally, they've not been studied because they were not easy to detect. So what happens is high frequencies are attenuated by the skull. But we can still pick up enough high frequencies on the skull to, to start studying them. And they certainly have been studied in cortical recordings in, during surgeries when the skull is, is opened up. And so you can read directly from the cortex. Turns out that the brain produces high frequencies in the range of 40 to 200 hertz or even higher during normal functioning. And it's not all, uh, this kind of activity is not all neuronal switching. It's due to other physiological processes that we don't fully understand. So wait, what's that? So what I'm asking here is this, this is an area <clears throat> that they don't have a lot of scientific papers on. Is this what? Right. And so we're, when you looked at that, the space, opening up of the different spaces that we're looking at this is really outer space this is a science yeah, it's completely new yeah we don't know about so very interesting so let's go so there are some papers now on um, that uh, on psychedelic ingestion and the effects of psychedelic injection what's in ingestion both in terms of uh, subjective effects and particularly the eg and other brain effects and fmri effects so it has been shown that, for example, taking DMT is associated with higher frequency power, higher gamma power, and higher synchrony, higher, higher synchronization of the gamma signals in the brain. And there's been studies on meditators. So now we're getting to meditation here. There been studies on meditators that show that uh, meditators typically show higher gamma brainwave amplitude compared to controls in different meditation traditions. So in my own explorations with uh, stimulating the brain with low levels of uh, alternating current and we're doing biofeedback and looking at the research and came up with this general format. So at the, it, normally we tend to stay in the middle frequency in terms of, in terms of the brain uh, produces all the frequencies all the time, but certain frequencies predominate. So in the waking state, this middle range predominates that corresponds to the usual mind, intellect, the conscious self, the personal, rational self. And then when the lower frequencies start to predominate is that's when we enter more like the level of being more connected to the body and the instinct, more unconscious material. Sometimes in psychology we call regression where there's more childlike feelings and actions can happen. That's when the lower frequencies are predominating. Sometimes you talk about theta states as being creative, which are low frequency states where you have hypnagogia, the ability to free associate, and the level of the pre-personal and the pre-rational. If you if the higher frequencies predominate, you tend to enter the level of intuition, superconscious states, transpersonal or post-rational states. So this is a very rough way of understanding high, low, and mid frequency. And well, what, we, what we do find is that typically if you move beyond this narrow region between the yellow lines, 
you get more of both. You get more of low and high simultaneously, and they balance each other out. So you're typically like expanding the kind of uh, state, subjective states you're in, your states of consciousness, into more of a variety of diversity. And then the power in the frequencies that we usually don't have so much power on, they, they obtain more power. So if I can understand this correctly, you're saying if you do a low frequency stimulation, you can amplify the high end. And if you do a high end, you can amplify the low end. It's sort of all, it's resonating. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, if it works well, yes. And typically they need each other. For example, the high frequencies will ride on the low frequencies. But sometimes when you do that and that doesn't happen is when you get some weird states and you don't feel so good. Yeah. So it doesn't always happen. Yeah. So this is a, some research that was done uh, way back by Maxwell Cade and then followed through by student Anna Wise and then Judith Bennington. So is looking at what is the brainwave pattern of uh, long-term meditators. And what they came up with a pattern they call the awakened mind pattern, and where the frequency axis is the vertical axis. And they showed that these long-term meditators tend to have this kind of a pattern where they have substantial power in all the bands, the low and the high, and not just the mid. The mid was actually lower, the mid band where the normal uh, consciousness resides was smaller, but there was more power in the extremes, and that both were needed to inform each other to be in a balanced state of mind. So I started to explore the idea of a balanced mind protocol using stimulation with uh, alternating current at different frequencies, and asked the question, can we create a high functioning mind with high mindfulness? and one that releases the grip of the narrative self. So we, these days we talk about meditation and mindfulness meditation, and the idea is to have a quiet, balanced mind and not be caught up in the stories of the past and the future and on so much on who I am, but just being present with what is. And uh, I discovered that I could start to get there by combining low and high frequency stimulation. But then the question started to come in, do I use alternating current? Stimulation, can I use infrared light? Because I've been using infrared light stimulation in my therapy practice for more than 10 years now. And do I use just biofeedback or do I use stimulation in, uh, with, in different forms? So at this point, I started to realize that actually stimulation with infrared light and doing pulsed photobiomodulation was more effective than using current for this purpose. Oh. So let's talk about that. So these are the possibilities I just talked about. On the top left, we have uh, an you know, AC current machine. Then we have flashing lights in the eyes on the right. We have biofeedback on the left bottom. And then we have uh, infrared headset on the bottom right. So talking about in photobiomodulation, I don't need to introduce it to your audience at this point. So photobiomodulation is already at a place near you with different forms. It's for the body, not just for the brain. And, uh, and we know that it has many, that when you apply a therapeutic level of infrared light to the tissues of the body, that has many beneficial effects in terms of repairing, restoring, and enhancing the function of the cells. That infrared light is absorbed uh, by the energy powerhouses in the cell, the mitochondria. It affects the respiration chain. It's absorbed by cytochrome C oxidase to produce more ATP, to release nitric oxide from the cell into the blood vessels and produce reactive oxygen species in small amounts for beneficial signaling in the cell. So what we've been interested in here is transcranial infrared photobiomodulation typically in the range of 600 to 1,000 nanometers wavelength with infrared LEDs. So this is a V-light device, V-light at 8, 10 nanometers, and that's shining infrared light through the skull, enough gets through the skull to have an effect, and intranasally. And so some, in, some interesting research that you know, viewers are aware of by now is uh, that 
frequencies do matter. So that was the first question. You can shine light just like a DC current, you can just shine a constant current, constant light up to the brain. Just like in a DC current, you have no frequency, the current is just flowing through the brain. But what happens when you start flashing the light at different frequencies? Well, it turns out MIT research showed that 40 hertz light flickering in the eyes, they did not use infrared light, they used visual light flickering in the eyes of mice, and they had actually decreased plaque and activated the microglial cells, which are the sort of the, the cells that remove the garbage from the brain. And just something about 40 hertz that did that, that other frequencies did not do that. So then the B light, the company B light asked the question, well, what if we just use 40 hertz flickering infrared light and shine it into the skull? Can we get a beneficial effect from doing that? And so the first question to ask is, if you pulse infrared into the brain, does that actually change the EEG? Is it going to have an effect similar to flashing a light in the eyes? That's not obvious that it will. So it turns out it does entrain the brain. And so this is a research done by the B light company with Lou Lim and uh, his associates, Reza and Jen and Abiram, that showed that pulsed infrared light transcranial and intranasal significantly modulates neural oscillations, which is the EEG produced by the brain. So you flash 40 hertz into the brain, you get more 10 hertz, you get more 40 hertz. You get more other frequencies as well. So general increase in gamma. Oh, well, and then, can we go back to that for one second, just to, yes. we're gonna have, uh, hopefully have Reza on later. So when you put the, 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 the significance, as you said, when you give them, 40 hertz, you yeah. have an increase in the gamma when you turn it on. Yeah, you actually have an increase in alpha, beta, and gamma. All of it, yeah. And is it, go, is it just over generally the whole brain, or is it over the areas that you're, that you're stimulating? Uh, this is generally over the brain, because the, the stimulation is generally over the brain, although it's more on the default mode network in this particular headset. Okay. But, uh, but the, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty widespread the way the stimulation is being done. And the light scatters in the skull. That's my understanding. Let's see if we can confirm that with Reza. Is it okay? And so my friends, uh, Jay Sanganetti over at the University of New Mexico, who was in the same lab that they did the research at, on TDCS and the threat detection task that we talked about earlier decided to do a study with uh, the B-Light. And so same, same kind of study, uh, students are brought in and they taught us to try to learn to detect threats on this video game. And while they're learning the task, they either get to their brain stimulated with the B-Light headset over the default mode network, or they get a, a sham stimulation. And it turns out that when you stimulate the brain with infrared light in the, with the B-Light headset over the default mode network uh, and flashing at 40 hertz, that's the called neuro gamma, you get, an, uh, you get very good learning. And the learning is even better than using DC stimulation. So the light works better than DC stimulation for improving the learning in this task. So that's a good sign of the effects of photobiomodulation on general uh, cognitive, you know, general cognitive improvement. So this is a NeuroGamma headset that we light cells that flashes at 40 hertz. And they've done some preliminary research on trauma, so on PTSD. And they showed that after 12 weeks, a score improved in the photobiomodulation group, but not in the control group. So in general, we're looking at how we can improve brain function by using pulsed photobiomodulation. And so that brings me to now the back to the balanced mind protocol, starting to look at how we use for, plus photobiomodulation to create a balanced mind. So here's a headset that, uh, so we've been talking to like over the years, and so they made uh, a headset for us that we can flash at uh, frequencies up to 10,000 hertz in order for us to experiment with the effects of different frequency, pulse frequencies 
on the subjective states of meditators. And so this is, this is new in the sense that stimulating the brain at high frequencies becomes possible with infrared light, becomes easy with infrared light and safe with infrared light, and it's not been possible before. We haven't really studied very high frequencies in the brain, especially trying to move the brain into very high frequencies before. That's completely new. So that's what we got to start doing with this device. So let's look at high frequency simulation and some subjective effects in terms of what we found so far. And we find that when we go above 40 hertz, then at 40 hertz and above, we get, this is a, these are general experiences, not everybody has these, but uh, there's a tendency to have increased self-observation, increased equanimity, and on positive emotion, joy, feelings of expansion. And when we get 100 hertz and above, you can get feelings of expansion, feelings of a change in your experience of how you feel yourself. And we've also tried certain interesting frequencies like musical notes, and people get some into interesting states of consciousness with those states. And typically you find that some people are more sensitive to small amounts of energy and other people are less sensitive. So people who are very sensitive or who have a lot of experience in meditation, it doesn't take them long to get into these states. So they already have some access, they have some awareness of subtle states and they can easily shift with the gentle push provided by these devices. Other people who, who may not have meditated or who may not have a lot of self-awareness, they may not notice much initially. They would have to habitually to it. And sometimes you can get into negative states like with any kind of stimulation. So instead of feeling good, you may feel agitated, dissociated, may have discomfort or sleep issues as your brain tries, as the energy tries to shift your brain into a different frequency. So if you look at a balanced mind you know, from a point of view of meditation, we find that in a balanced mind, there's a balance of opposing factors. Mm. There's a balance between calmness and energy. If you just have calmness, you can just fall asleep. You have to have energy to stay really present. Similarly, there's a balance between pleasant feelings that arise when you meditate, you get joy, bliss, many pleasant feelings. But if you get caught up in those feelings, you will get agitated or you know, greedy, but you balance it with equanimity where you're just you know, neutral with it simultaneously. And similarly, there's a balance between having a focused mind and then a mind that's investigative so you can learn something from that meditative state and you can use it. So this idea of balance sort of goes back to the balance between low and high frequencies in the awakened mind and between the balance of the, of the pre-personal and the transpersonal states that I talked about earlier. So what we found by is that if you combine low frequency and high frequency combination stimulation, if you combine it, then we get nicely balanced states of expansion, lightness, perceptual clarity, energy reduction in thought, stillness, and so on. So we get these effects typically by these combining of these low and high frequencies. Because if, for example, low frequency will relax the body, the high frequency will give you more energy, and then the two will start balancing themselves out. So you, could, you did those simultaneously? Actually, in this case, because of the nature of the device, initially we did them sequentially. But we, had, but we had the same effect, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's an exam. We are working with this meditation teacher, like Chula Dasa, and he talked about how he could easily access some of the highest states in his meditation system using this device. And here's another teacher, Shenzhen Yang, doing working with this. And so the basic idea is to help the user, you as a user, whether you're a beginning meditator or a senior meditator, to increase the depth, breadth, and flexibility of access to mind states. So we want to be able to use a device like this to help you to deepen your practice, to broaden the kind of states you get, get into, and have the flexibility to move back and forth. And so right now, 
I am doing a study with the pus photobiomodulation, transcranial photobiomodulation. And the idea is to demonstrate that this is a real effect. And we wanted to use long-term meditators initially so that we don't need to do a lot of sessions. With a long-term meditator, we can get a big effect in one session because they have this flexibility that's already there. And so the idea is to have three sessions and uh, we'll have both active and sham stimulation. And then we'll do pre and post EEG recordings and have a number of measures to capture the state of the meditation and mood, even some sleep measures, and to show that in active, in active stimulation, a meditator will have a frequency that they really like or a set of frequencies that really work for them to go really deep quickly. And so this study is uh, just starting. We just submitted the IRB and being funded by VLight to do this study with their device. I, so there's also a startup company called Sensei, and I joined them as a chief clinical officer recently. And they have a set of a headset, you could say, or MindSense headphones is what they call them. And these are headphones with three EEG electrodes and six infrared LEDs. And so the idea in the EEG electrode is to pick up your EEG and use that to, as a biofeedback device to help you to meditate. And using a, an app on the phone, smartphone, as well as stimulate the brain with pulsed infrared light to help you to get into these meditation states and to guide you through the headphones simultaneously. And not only that, they have a heart rate variability monitor also built into the headphones. And so you can actually do biofeedback with your heart rate and work with your breath in heart rate. So there's a bunch of different possibilities. You can, if you have, you can use it at home to help with you with your sleep, to enter different meditation states and to improve focus, to increase uh, your cognitive performance. And you've seen this work clinically? You've been working with this? Yeah, actually, I've been working with them. So I, I, we, they have the prototypes are built, the apps are built, and uh, I've tested them. I, I think they're really good. I really like them. What they actually, if they had them available these days when everybody's staying home, that would have been great. But what they're really looking for right now is funding to get started manufacturing. That's where they are. That's the stage of the cycle they're in. So if anybody wants to fund them, let me know. <laughs> We're looking for funding. All right. And so that's most of the talk. I mean, I actually had talked earlier about using AC current on the body for healing different conditions, but that's not relevant for, for today. So let's, let, let me see if while we have you here, if you want to go um, <laughs> to the balanced mind uh, slide for a sec. Yeah. I like that sensei thing, and I like the study one. Uh, well, this one. Yeah, yeah. Go, go down to this one. One more, one more down. Oh, okay. Uh, what was the one? Here? Because uh, the balance, the this one here, like that. Oh yeah, the awakened mind. Okay. Awakened mind. Yeah, sure. Now you stated that. Uh, this was here. Uh, let me, yeah. so this is the, you're talking about low, uh, high alpha or low alpha, which, what does that mean? Okay, so what this is actually showing is that, uh, that there's, a, there's, there's a lot of power in alpha. So uh, you can see how the lobes of the alpha stick out. That means it has more power than the other bands. So uh, I just was, looking for uh, quickly while you were talking yeah and it looked here at the neural correlates of a dnt experience assessed with multivariate eeg and i guess you'd be the guy to talk to about this because you said you had some spiritual awakening so i was also wondering what 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 that awakening was like uh, because you know someone who has experienced what they call an awakened mind Mm -hmm. Right, you found that the meditators themselves can quickly get into that state, correct? Right. So, if someone has an awakened mind, if you will, 
is it different than a balanced mind? Yeah, so, so the idea, yeah, this is a tricky subject in the sense that a balanced, it's how you're using the term. So I'm using the term balanced mind to define a meditative state. It doesn't necessarily mean an awakened mind. Okay. So a balanced mind state would be you're meditating and you're, you have a good end level of energy, you have deep relaxation, you have some positive feelings, but you also have some equanimity. So what they, we call that a balance of different factors. Okay. So that's when you're in a balanced meditation state. Okay. So that's what that's what I was trying to produce with this. Okay. And then awakened mind actually has means a lot more than that. It means uh, it's an ability to move into balance quickly, and uh, and it also has other meanings which really have to do with your uh, identity. It's an understanding. Ultimately, an awakened mind has the understanding that who you are is not defined by any, anything in your mind. In other words, any ideas about yourself do not define you. Very good. Yeah. So it's actually, big, and it becomes a trait. So, so it's very easy for you to, whatever is happening in your life, you can, you can move into a witnessing of it because you realize that that's not, it doesn't affect the true you, whatever is going on. It's not affected by what's happening. And now, so you are, because here's the thing, you've been, you're able to, so two different things. You're able, and you know more about what the transformational technology people are doing, but right. you're able to kind of give somebody an idea of how their brain is doing. Is it a, you know, enlightenment has to yeah, do with- so what you're asking me the question, is there a signature of enlightenment that we found and we can look at the brain and say, okay, this signature shows that you're awakened. The answer is no, we haven't quite found. We have some intriguing clues, but we don't have the signature. Mm -hmm. so, so, so some of the intriguing clues have to do with higher frequencies. That's, what I'm, that's where I am. That's the state of the art right now. And the funny and thing the intriguing clues have to do with having power in frequencies like 120 hertz and higher. Because the awakened mind model, which you put here, mm -hmm. does not have gamma. Yeah, because it's old research. Okay. Yeah. Old so, correct. Yeah, it's because they were, you know, this started, you know, way back in the 80s or even early. Maxwell Cade was in the 70s. Yeah. So let's go to the uh, let's go to the uh, one that had the gamma. Your 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 design that had the gamma. The the the, the two separate ones like that. Okay. There we are, that one. Oh, you mean like a... Uh, Back one slide. Let's see if we can find This one, this one. Okay, yeah. So the blue line that we're looking at is zero to 100, that's hertz, correct? Yeah, 100 plus, yeah. I like that. Now, what they found here was when someone was given a DMT injection mm -hmm. and a placebo, they saw reduced oscillatory power in the alpha and beta, beta bands and mm -hmm. robust, robustly increased spontaneous signal diversity. Right. The oscillatory, importantly, the emergence of oscillatory activity within the delta and theta bands was found to correlate with the peak of the experience, particularly its eye-closed visual component. The, these findings highlight that Mark changes in oscillatory activity and signal diversity with DMT, the parallel broad and specific subjective experiences, thus advancing our understanding of the neurobiology. So again, yes. this is, they, they didn't get into the, maybe they didn't get into the gamma, I'm gonna take a picture here, but they saw that the alpha and beta was reduced and that the, uh, the visual experience of a DMT experience or uh, you know what, probably what that is better than me, but that I mean, what it's called was a emergence of oscillatory activities within the delta and the theta frequency band. Yeah, so so I, that's actually this is you're right. So this is an, a, this is another way of uh, understanding it, this diagram actually. 
So they saw, what they found in the BMP experience was that there was a drop in power in the alpha and beta bands. So right. these are the alpha and beta bands between the yellow lines. That's where we live most of the time. So we move, so in the DNT experience, we're moving out of the usual place where we live. There's a drop in the power of alpha and beta. And there's an increase in power in that particular paper in the delta and theta, which is this part here. And that and the theta particularly corresponds to more imagery. That's also well known. So there's, there's that connection, okay? So when you have a hypnagogic state, for example, when you're about to fall asleep, that's called hypnagogia, you have increased theta, that's when your theta is increasing. Okay? And you get these weird images, you know. And so, so that's what they find, that there's an increase in the, in the power in those ranges and you get corresponding greater imagery. And, and, and so this is consistent with moving out of the usual state of consciousness. What's what I'm saying, as you move out of the usual realm, you move more into the edges, that's when you get altered states. And the idea behind, say, a device like what I'm talking about, which will pulse infrared at, uh, at different frequencies, is to not only give more energy to your brain to function better and cause healing, but to increase your ability and range to move into these different states. Let's move to a low frequency state or a high frequency state or some combination, and then you find that you can easily start to access these states and with, with non-chemical means. That's also significant. So again, so having training the brain with oscillatory frequencies of light is yeah. expanding the bandwidth of your ability to think. Yes. So we if we give it uh, the if we give a constant wave uh, infrared laser, as Doctor uh, uh, right. Gonzalez Lima pointed out, alpha and beta go up. Highly. Right. So you're more into the mind and the intellect and the cognition as we're talking about. Yeah, and that may be good to help you to function more at the you know the regular level, you know, or the, the social level or the task level. That's good too. Right. But if you want to increase your creative flexibility, what they found in the paper, which is significant, they're talking about the increased diversity in the EEG, that there's great diversity which corresponds to increased diversity in your mind states, the ability to be in diverse at diverse experiences. If that's what you want, then we can use different frequencies to help you to move into those states. So what would you, uh, I mean, the, the, the research that's coming out now mm -hmm. is, you're saying, if this paper had looked at the ultra high gamma or gamma, because it only went up to 45 hertz, really. Right, right. If it looked at the higher frequencies, would you see the like you stated the low and the high going up at the same time or but more predominantly maybe if you stimulated with low frequencies you would have a low frequency thing i mean are you gonna have i mean you know, yeah i would say i would say the chances are that you would see both and in in that particular case uh, so we'll have to see now it is true that in, with some other psychedelics the the way the brain functions is maybe different than maybe it drops power all across the board. And what changes is the timing, the synchronization of the signal. So there's, it's a little simplistic the way I presented it. There's also a question of synchronization timing. But, uh, but overall, there's changes at both low and high bands would be even a, a more broader way to say. It. So for example, you may get a, a, a real uh, synchronization of the down band, for example that you wouldn't get otherwise, yeah. If you are to, like, so since there's not too many devices that can stimulate above mm -hmm. 40 hertz at this point, I mean, there's right. super pulsed uh, things that people are putting into the brain and, you know, they get, right. but stimulating the brain or activating the brain or putting energy into the brain on a different wavelength of light, there's a myriad of wavelengths and we've kind of narrowed down the ones we want to use. Yeah, yeah. You know? But then once you switch into the frequency of the- of flickering, power, yeah, that's a whole other story. Everybody yeah. gets a little bit different. And so you and your group and uh, have been really kind of investigating this at the higher, higher levels. Is there anything that you would suggest? I mean, 
if you're meditating, so I haven't looked at all the EEGs of the meditation, but you were saying in your research, once mm -hmm. you have re arrived at that state, it's easier to get back in there. Right. Do you have the ability to uh, like um, pick uh, the, uh, you're letting these, the, the, the meditators pick which frequency they want to Stimulate. Well, it's both. Uh, right now, so it's, you know, there's such a wide range of possibilities. So what I'm doing right now is I, I have a fixed set that I think is useful. There's a little bit I know about. I, mean, I don't know all of it. And then I have them, I, I stimulate the meditators. I go through a sequence with them at different frequencies and ask them about their experience and have them pick their top few. And I, and I combine it with some low frequencies, and then we have a formula that's unique to that person. So we do a bit of both. As a, but I have some ideas of what I want them to play with, and I'm going very high, I'm going, you know, 1200 hertz, for example. So, so finding very intriguing effects at these high frequencies. And, and, the, and the way we're doing the simulation is we're doing the synchronized uh, pulsing over the whole brain, and there's so many other possibilities. But the idea behind this is to put people into these more creative, psychedelic kind of states, as opposed to, say, just improving your ability to do better math or do better executive function. They're two different things. If you want to do that, then I will do something else. Mm -hmm. That's what, say, the neuro gamma is designed to do. And the timing makes a difference. So if you I think Lou will say something about how they discovered that uh, uh, that you have to time the signals, uh, you know, out of phase from the front and the back to get a better cognitive functioning going. Wow. And that has to do with the timing in the brain. And, and I'm deliberately not doing that when it comes to meditation, because in a way we are not trying to cognitively function better in this case, but to enter deeper states. And they're not, this one can actually be the negative of the other, interestingly enough. So sometimes when you meditate a lot, you lose a certain amount of ability to, to do a certain level of cognitive functioning because in a way you're so out there, you know? It's like, the, and ultimate, the ultimate name of the game is to be really flexible. And a lot of my own personal life has been about that. You know, I'm sort of a scientist and an artist, a psychotherapist, a researcher, and really been moving across the various realms and, and uh, and finding a way to be really flexible and being able to be on task and have a certain kind of brainwave and timing pattern and also be really open and available to the universe, which is a very different kind of a brainwave timing pattern. That's, that's, that's excellent. I think that's kind of what we're seeing, you know, as we look across the, va the, the vast presenters mm -hmm. and everything is like, uh, uh, is there a place and you know that these brains are sad let's say we have the depression people which is a you know a type of a brain that has a certain characteristic and function and brain waves right. right and so you know what do you do and what's the best plan to move them out to you know is it just an energy thing or is it an emotional thing you know and where's the emotions coming from is it coming from a signature brain pattern or is it coming from their consciousness or their sadness or is it something deeper? So I, mean, I think that you touched on many, many great points here. And again, there's more to research and more, and more to, to look at. What, what do you see? You've got these space age helmets and things that you're doing. What do you see the future, Sanjay? What do you think is going to happen if, we, you know, you look back at 20 years, 20, 30 years of your experience, and here we are in 2020. What do you look forward to 2030? What do you see happening? Okay. Well, people yeah. to dial in their, you know, look on their smartphone and put in the mood that they want and achieve it. <laughs> okay. It's a good question. Well, let me first address the, actually address also the question of depression that's close to my heart. So when I work with depression, I would say, uh, you know, I see it as a multi, it's a system with different facets. And so the more you can approach the different sides, even if you touch one, the other is impacted. So I may, I may energize that person with TDCS, look at their brain, energize certain parts of it, say their left frontal lobe, 
or give them some infrared light stimulation, but that might bring up emotions. You know, for example, depression is often associated with learned helplessness and trauma. So then that might say, well, I don't feel comfortable because it's sort of pulling them out of a homeostatic state. And then we might say, well, let's look at that discomfort. It's some resistance to feeling strong or powerful or there's some feelings of helplessness that you need to become aware of or some belief about yourself that's negative that we need to address. And when you, so one gives the other more power. If you can do both, it just, you move the person really fast. So that's the way I see it. I, I, that's so that's so deep and when you're you know we've talked about people and different practitioners on the on the program to talk about emotional trauma and what is the place of energy going into the brain which right. you know could have this thing and that you're saying that it's you're going to energize the brain and you may come up with memories and you may come up with right. feelings and emotions uh, that you know, our, what are the, that's not a, it's not a side effect, it's an effect. Right. right, exactly. That's the way I see it. Very well said. Yeah. So you're going to, and you, because you're, you know, a computer scientist right. and a psychotherapist and a medical, right. you when, when these things come up, you have the, like, the MacGyver Swiss Army knife of tools to kind of peel back a little bit, uh, let them be calm or however you're going to do it, which as a practitioner, you know, uh, not like a, a body worker or, or something like that might not have those tools. What would you say would happen? I mean, how would you suggest if you, if you're, someone's using this at home and all of a sudden they, ah, I had a nightmare, you know, here I'm putting this thing on for, I want to have better focus. Right. I want to have better circulation to my brain. And the next thing is I'm having nightmares. What would you, how would you, do you, do, how do you see that coming about? I mean, especially dealing with the pathological brain. Let's say someone yeah. has a trauma, traumatic brain injury. So they've got that that's going to blend in with PTSD. So there's a nidus maybe in their brain, and then there's this emotional component. And then we put light on their head to say, okay, let's turn up the, the volume, turn up the energy on this level. Well, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, so, so, so in general, what we're finding is that, uh, you know, with certain specific ranges, like using 10 or 40 hertz, in general, people are not having some major effects that need to be addressed, although that's not 100% true in my experience. There will be people who will have some effects that really need to be addressed. They may slow down the brain too much or speed up the brain, cause some anxiety. I've seen that. I've used this in my practice. So ideally what you want is them to know that something like that can happen. And if it does, you, here's, you, know, you need to address it with something. And so in my practice, of course, I use it. It's under supervision. People will come and talk to me. So that's the best way to do it, is have some, either a way to somebody, to have a way to turn to some people who know about this so you can start to address it with them, who have some knowledge of the brain as well as of the mind. And because that's what you're playing with, right? I like it because I mean, we if we if we don't talk about the mind, yeah, we're really sort of kind of missing the boat because somebody has to talk about, you know, not just a slice of the cell and what it does to the mouse and right. what it does to the humanism of our, of of our being, which kind of for, for for lack of a better place, we think of it, you know, between our ears. So, and so the other thing is when we when we you know, roll out to the more at a consumer level, the more of the meditation kinds of headsets, which let you go into these other states, I think we're going to need more supervision than just doing 10 hertz headsets or 40 hertz headsets. Because I think that people will have more of a wide range of responses. So, so that's really something that we, we're in the process of figuring out right now. So that's a very valid question. Beautiful. And there's uh, the uh, Sensei guys, the Sensei headset. We have a couple of people, you know, there's a couple more devices coming out that will mm -hmm. allow you to dial in concentration or calmness or focus. And I think, wow, that's pretty amazing that they can pull that off. There's, everybody's got a calm app now. People got a right. sleep app now. People got a meditation app now. And if we can give them the boost, or give them a little bit more bandwidth or energy or kind of show them this way, 
you know, is that, uh, is it a, uh, the shift state that these devices and these pr protocols are trying to put on, you know, what is the ultimate goal? I mean, should the person, uh, you know, wasn't it the guru that would decide what state <laughs> you were in and where you should go? But now we've got, I can choose to pick up my phone, right? Let me see if I can get that phone in there. And I can pick, pick, choose my state. What does it, you know, do you think that that's, that's a, first of all, is it viable? You, you probably yes. are seeing it. Yes, it's viable. It's going to happen. You, it can happen. So there's a future. Right. That's looking yeah. in the future. And yeah. the second thing is, is it, is, it a, is it a good thing? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So every, every solution that we come up with in a society creates new problems. So we already know it's going to create a new problem. That is not at all surprising to me. Okay, so I fully expect that to create its own set of problems. Who decides, you know, and what happens if somebody overdoes it? You know, they just keep training the same state. Then you get stuck in that state. I mean, that's what I'm counseling against, kind of, by doing this kind of research, right? Flexibility. And so there'll have to be a, a level of education about, it. okay, now that you have more power, to determine your states, you know, how how can that be misused or how to use it wisely, what are the possibilities? And and you know, it's like anything, right? So you can take psychedelics and benefit from it, and you can take psychedelics and not benefit from it and actually have to change. I agree. I think that's a, a, a perfect a per perception because mm -hmm. anything that changes your alters your state is can be an altered state. And we don't want to be stuck. That's what you're saying. Right. So, I mean, it, what we'll say, I know one thing. In 10 years, we're going to look back and say, do you remember how we used to stare at our phones like 10 hours a day? <laughs> they're going to say, well, that's not good for you. You know, they're going to say, and then they may say, you know, remember those guys who used to put the low frequency stimulation in their brain like all the time because it felt cool? Well, that, you know, we now we know that's not good for you. <laughs> right. Right? So, I read some of those things and decided maybe that wasn't so smart. <laughs> Remember when they used to give out cigarettes when we were going through the cafeteria line in college? It helped us, you know, focus because we smoked and we had caffeine and a cigarette and our minds were activated. And it was a great lunch because after you eat, then you wanted to power up your brain. And caffeine and nicotine were a great thing. Wasn't that, wasn't that crazy when we used to think that? So thank you for a look at the future. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Joe. That was fun.